I'd like to introduce our first two keynote speakers. Zach Luton is currently a neurologist with Annadale Medical Group, and he's the stroke medical director at Santa Rosa Memorial Hospital. He's born in Dallas, Texas. He did his residency at the University of Rochester. His neurology training at the University of Michigan and was in 10 years of private practice before he joined us here in Santa Rosa. I think you'll find him a very engaging speaker and an incredibly warm human being. Joey English heads our partner in the systematic care of large vessel occlusion strokes. Dr. English got his undergraduate degree at Swarthmore he then got his MD and his PhD at Baylor and then completed his neurology training and fellowship at the University of California in San Francisco. He's currently the medical director for the Neurointerventional Surgery Service at CPMC. So with that, I'd like to start. Dr. Luton. Alrighty, so I think I'm wired up and you can hear me. Um, let's see, does this advance? Yes, it does. All right. So I'm going to give kind of an overview about stroke care as it is now, uh, both in the big picture and also kind of some of the details. And uh, just as I've worked closely with Dr. English over the last couple of years setting this program up and getting things running, we'll kind of see into his expertise on taking care of large vessel occlusions and acute thrombus removal. Um, as he said, I'm stroke medical director at Santa Rosa Memorial, and we're a joint commission certified primary stroke center, and we've done a lot of work to improve things over the last few years. A stroke is a focal neurologic dysfunction caused by an acute lack of blood flow resulting in the regional death of neurons. Strokes kill brain cells. There's really no such thing as a mini stroke, and I hear that all the time, and it's kind of either a stroke or it's not, but you can have a stroke without symptoms, and you can have a stroke only causing very minor deficits. So it's true that sometimes we only know based on the MRI whether there was a completed stroke or not. TIAs, seizures, and migraines can also result in acute neurologic dysfunction. And these are kind of the differential sometimes when people have an acute neurologic change. But in those cases, there's no regional death of neurons, and the deficits should improve over time. Transient ischemic attacks are stroke-like event lasting minutes or hours that occurs when an area of the brain is deprived of oxygen just temporarily, and then the blood flow comes back, so the neurons come back to functioning normally. TIAs don't result in permanent brain damage, but are a significant risk factor for future strokes. This is kind of the big deal about TIAs, is when somebody has a TIA, we're trying to help prevent something bad happening in the future. Um, about one-third of untreated TIA patients will go on to have a completed stroke. About 8% of these strokes will happen in the first month of the TIA. About 11% will occur within three months, 15% within a year, and 33% within five years. So there's a significant increased risk. That's why we take, take TIA seriously and, and work them up really the same way we do an acute stroke. Common signs and symptoms, sudden unexplained numbness or weakness of the face, arm, or leg, usually on one side of the body, uh, sudden trouble speaking or understanding what is said, sudden trouble seeing for one of both eyes, sudden trouble walking, loss of balance and coordination, acute neurologic change that's generally focal, meaning one part of the nervous system is not working. Stroke is the number four cause of death in the United States. We've improved somewhat to number three, or else other things have gotten worse, depending on how you look at it. But stroke is a leading cause of disability, and this is really the biggest issue with stroke, is, is the cost overwhelming for the healthcare system. Kills more than 160,000 Americans each year. On average, about every 53 seconds, someone in the U.S. experiences a stroke. And on every, average, every four minutes, someone dies of a stroke. Stroke risk increases with age, so the older you are, the more likely you may have a stroke. And of course, with the aging of the population, this becomes more of an issue. 72% of all strokes occur in people over the age of 65. And we paid about $73.7 billion in 2010 for stroke-related medical costs. It is an enormous drain on the healthcare system. 
This, in a way, is, is part of the background of what we're talking about today, because the more strokes we can prevent, the more strokes we can acutely help improve, the less disability and the less cost of the system in the long run. We're taking people and restoring them to a normal quality of life, rather than being in a nursing home the rest of their life. Types of strokes, about 85% are ischemic strokes, meaning that either an emboli, a clot, plaque, a little piece of fat which traveled from somewhere else, lodged in a brain artery and blocked blood flow, or thrombotic where the local clot forms right in the brain artery, right where the damage is done. Hemorrhagic strokes or bleeds caused by bleeding of a blood vessel uh, can be due to an aneurysm, trauma, or high blood pressure, hypertension being the, the big risk factor we watch for. Remember the wires cross. This is kind of neurology 101, but it's something that I deal with every day is that, you know, the right side of the brain controls the left side of the body, and that kind of thing. So a lot of times, if the person has a deficit that's on one side, I've got to remind the folks on the phone that I'm talking to that that is likely to mean the lesion is on the other side of the brain. Uh, cerebellar strokes are a little more complicated sometimes because they can be unilateral because the wires cross twice. The initial workup, when these folks show up, um, Everything has to be done faster and faster nowadays. Uh, the window for giving thrombolytic therapy, we keep reducing it, trying to take care of folks faster and faster. So we're getting all these things done immediately. Nowadays, it's happening a lot of times when the ambulance hits the ED door. More and more facilities like the Cleveland Clinic are starting to do a lot of this stuff in the ambulance. Uh, they're even rolling out an ambulance with a CT scanner in it to get some of this stuff done in the field. But EKG, CBC, got another coags, how their kidney function's doing, cardiac enzymes. We always want a non-contrast head CT, and recently, because of changes in um, some of the scientific literature that's been published over the last couple of years, we need a CT angiogram, because now there's something we can do about it. And Dr. English is gonna talk about large vessel occlusions and, and acute arterial blockages. Pulse ox and a blood glucose. Blood sugar is, is toxic to the brain, particularly when the brain is injured. And this is something I see kind of ignored or downplayed quite a bit. Uh, these folks come in with, you know, high sugars, and sometimes that does not get treated. But the higher the blood glucose, the more toxic it is to the brain, and the brain's already under stress. So treating sugar is another important part of this. TPA, or tissue plasminogen activator, this was the first big sea change in stroke care. Finally, we could do something acutely. It's a serine protease enzyme found on the endothelial cells lining the blood vessels, and it helps catalyze the conversion of plasminogen to plasmin, which is what helps us break down our clots. It speeds the clot breakdown. Uh, it's FDA approved now for use within four and a half hours of symptom onset, and uh, the main benefit is reduction of future disability. Time is brain. This is why we're running around so fast all the time trying to get all these things done quickly and urgently and correctly every time. Uh, this curve basically shows us that the longer you wait to give TPA, the less well it works, basically. That's the way to think about it. And down here, we have no benefit from TPA right here. And so that comes out to be right close to three hours out, depending on the window and the patient. Now, if you select patients, there's certainly some people who benefit much farther out than this. And there's other folks who are unlikely to benefit, depending on the situation. But the important take-home message is time equals brain. The faster we do things, the better chance the patient has for recovery. The TPA was approved based on several trials, and it was interesting, in, in the beginning, the trials were weaker than we would have liked it. Liked. And there was a lot of controversy back and forth with it, but over time we've seen, yeah, there definitely is benefit, even some of the naysayers, and, and even I was not as excited about it when it first came out as later we've decided, yeah, this is a good therapy. Uh, and, and the trials have been repeated and the window's been extended out a bit. Uh, and again, the main thing we see is the benefit is actually, we're shifting the curve, basically, on how folks do long time, you know, it's over, over the term. So this is three months after their stroke. The folks getting the sugar pill, their NIH stroke scale score, they're more likely to have a low score than the folks with placebo. Uh, other scores of functional disability, how people are able to live their lives and do their activities daily, daily living, we see significant improvement in the folks who receive TPA here in this good area where they're able to be independent, take care of themselves at home, not need much assistance. The curve has kind of shifted all the way over, and we do have fewer people dying, but, but realistically the main benefit is over in this area. It's reducing disability at three months. So it's not necessarily that the patient is going to magically improve just as we give the TPA. It does happen.
Americans. But even the folks who don't seem to improve immediately, a lot of them will do better at three months than the folks that did not receive TPA. The window was extended based on further trials, uh, added some exclusion criteria, which again are changing over time as we get better and better at selecting patients. But uh, initially they said, we wouldn't do this in folks over the 80, folks with an NIH stroke scale greater than 25, which is very severe deficits, very high risk of hemorrhagic transformation or bleeding after the stroke. Uh, folks that are on an oral anticoagulant, regardless of their INR or history of both diabetes and prior stroke. Uh, but this showed, with these criteria, a favorable outcome at three months in 52.4% of TPA patients versus 45.2% in the folks on placebo. Uh, and this was a randomized controlled, fairly strong trial. Nowadays, uh, this has been a sea change recently. I, I was a resident at the time. We were looking for ways to remove clots from folks and restore blood flow. And I spent a lot of time in the middle of the night running around in circles as a resident trying to get folks to the cath lab and get things done. And unfortunately, back then, the data just didn't bear up what we were doing. It was a little bit disappointing uh, with the Mercy Retriever was the one we were working with. A number of devices were tried, and for a while this was shelved a little bit, but now we've had five major trials with the new devices showing incredible success, and the trials have been consistent. And Dr. English is going to talk much more about this. He is definitely the expert in this area. Uh, and just as a teaser, he's going to show you much prettier pictures than I have, but this is a clot that was retrieved from a patient from Santa Rosa Memorial after he was transferred to CPMC in August 2015. And you can see how beautiful this technology does in retrieving an intact clot. And this is awesome. We're getting these out. We're not causing a lot of shower of emboli to the brain. They're not doing damage to the blood vessel walls. They're just able to remove the clot. This is really a wonderful thing. Uh, partially because TPA really is only effective at maybe eating through the first two or three millimeters of clot. So folks with small clots can do very well with TPA. Folks with large clots, you may not get much benefit from the IV form of the drug. Acute stroke at Santa Rosa Memorial. This has been a continuous quality improvement has been our mission basically since I got here a couple of years ago. Uh, the hospital is already making big strides working on this with an excellent stroke team. But uh, Santa Rosa Memorial was initially certified as a primary stroke center in 2010 and recertified in 2012. Uh, and we just got recertified again last year, and, and luckily we got some best practices. We did very well. Uh, the surveyor was very complimentary to our program, which was very rewarding to those of us that work at this day to day. What we've seen is a dramatic improvement in door-to-ED physician contact, uh, like we talked about, meeting the ambulance, sometimes right in the ambulance bay, doing a lot of stuff in the CT scanner. Uh, TPA is now routinely delivered near or under 60 minutes. Of course, the goal keeps changing. We're going to go to 45. We may keep going down as nationally things improve. Uh, we've computerized the stroke protocols. One of the big things I'm a believer in is trying to do things the same way every time without a lot of drama. We don't want to be excited all running around wondering what we're going to do. We want to know what we do, and we do it, and everything proceeds smoothly. This is how you get every patient take care of the best way possible 24-7. Um, ICUs now staffed with intensivists 24-7. This is an enormous benefit to our stroke patients and to me personally. I'm very happy having intensivists there to take care of my patients. And we've got inpatient neurorehabilitation on site, so we can do the full spectrum of care. Uh, key times, this is kind of an overview. When we first started working on this stuff, we needed to get data. And so we generated a lot of data on what's happening and how can we improve it. Um, so we've seen some improvement in door to MD contact. Uh, one of the things that the point of this slide is to show the reduction in variability of the curve. So initially, you know, sometimes we did great, sometimes not so great. It was different every case up and down. Some folks knew how to do things smoothly. Some folks couldn't use the computer, all this kind of stuff. Uh, same thing with CT scan, you know, it gradually reduced the variability and speeded up the process. Lab orders have sometimes been even more of a tricky situation to try to speed things along with lab, but we've made actually, actually since this slide was done, we've made quite a bit of progress in there where it's not really an issue. And door to TPA times, we've taken out the variability and, and remained close to 60 minutes. All this improvement has been enormous overall when you put it together. So our door to needle times for TPA have improved significantly, along with a lot of variability, but you can see the trend line, how it's improved over time. And as we've done the process improvements and things, you see dramatic improvements in the variability of the curve. 
Here we had a little bump when we added the CTA in 2015 as a routine on every case. Of course, that slows us down a little bit because we got another scan we got to check. We've got to wait for another read. We've got to do other things with IVs to get contrast in the patient. But luckily, uh, our radiology team did a good job of catching us back up, and we've been able to continue with our improvement of keeping TPA times right at 60 minutes. Um, this little hospital's doing real good, actually. There's a lot of bigger facilities across the country that would like our numbers and, and how we've improved things. But again, sometimes in smaller hospitals, it's easier to improve things more quickly. But uh, since 2014, our average time has dropped to 58 minutes. Uh, you know, it was 100 minutes back in 2011. The core measures, kind of all the different spectrum of care, all the things we do, we're trying to get right every time. And so we've had quite a bit of improvement in this as well. Uh, not only, again, the reduction of variability, but these lines are nicely heading up here to a perfect score, perfect care for the patient. So uh, the number of patients getting appropriate care has come up, as well as the, the, the total composite process score, doing everything right every time. And here in December 2015, we're starting to reach really, really good you know, care for every patient every time across the spectrum of the whole end of stroke care. And uh, inpatient mortality, one of the hardest things for me of, of taking care of stroke is that uh, stroke kills a lot of people. And sometimes the folks show up and there's not much you can do and um, you know, you're gonna have some mortality. So we expect some degree of mortality, but the process improvements have helped this tremendously as well. Uh, we had quite a bit of variability, quite a bit of problems with, with stroke mortality. One of the things that helped enormously was when we developed this protocol for taking care of large vessel occlusions. If you can get the big clot out, the person's much likely to do much, much better. And so with the help of Dr. English and the folks at CPMC, our mortality dropped quite a bit. Uh, and we've also implemented some other process improvements, and this is ongoing. And so we're trying to keep the mortality down here at zero. Um, this is by the grace of God, not necessarily me. As far as keeping it at zero, we, we will have some folks die, but we have been able to make some enormous improvements in this. Basically, big picture, hypertension is in some ways the biggest issue with respect to stroke. So post-stroke, if you're not given TPA, we want to let the blood pressure run a little high initially to keep the brain perfused. Uh, you know, if it's too high, we've got to lower it to give TPA. If it's too high, there's a higher risk of bleed. And so we do bring it down if we need to, but generally we let them run pretty high. And uh, once they get, you know, 220, 120, we start wanting to bring it down gently. Four days after stroke, you start lowering the blood pressure gradually as needed. A lot of times the body, as it adapts, the body begins to lower the blood pressure itself. Uh, there's a lot of changes that happen with perfusion pressure, but to some degree, the body knows what it needs. And so to some extent, the body will keep the pressure up a little bit, trying to maintain perfusion to the brain. Higher blood pressure, as long as it's not above 220 over 120, does not increase the risk of post-stroke bleeding or hemorrhagic transformation. And that's, that's been studied. Carotid imaging, uh, one of the major issues with stroke are, of course, these embolic strokes coming from the carotid arteries. And this causes our most damaging strokes a lot of times and is also a very frequent cause of stroke. So patients with symptomatic carotid narrowing greater than 60% should be referred for potential vascular surgery. Now, some of those folks won't have benefit unless it's more above 70%. Some older folks, there's not necessarily a reason to do a, a, a carotid endarctectomy. Um, basically, the risk reduction is over about 10 years. So if somebody has 10 years left of, of reasonable quality of life, then it may be reasonable to open those carotids up because uh, you're reducing the risk of stroke over the long term. And this shows a severe internal carotid artery narrowing. Here we come up and look at this little pinched off thing here. Uh, and that's, you know, feeding this person's brain. We'd like that opened up. Carotid ultrasound versus CT angiogram. This has been another thing. Because of the acute need, CT angiogram has taken over in the acute situation, but we still use carotid ultrasound quite a bit. Uh, the overall concordance is about 79.1% between the two. Uh, carotid ultrasound tended to both underestimate and overestimate the degree of stenosis. The, the trick is it just has more variability in the readings. Uh, CTA changed the treatment in about 16% of cases, but practically most vascular surgeons want to see a CTA before they're going to operate. So a lot of times we end up with a carotid ultrasound as a, a screening test. And if we're seeing a significant stenosis, then either we will get the CTA or sometimes the operating physician will want to check one before surgery in cases where surgery is going to be delayed. 
Um, so ultrasound remains the standard, it's cheap, it's, it's everywhere, but CTA is becoming more and more an important tool for this, particularly in looking for acute occlusions, because we want to know, is the vessel really occluded or not, and how acute is that thrombus? Echocardiogram, we need to look for the thrombus, the blood clot within the heart chambers. That's another major risk of emboli for stroke. A little bits of clot breaking loose, floating up to the brain and causing strokes. A lot of times these are multifocal clots, or strokes, because the little bits of clot break loose will have a shower of emboli up to the brain and you can see patchy areas of change in the brain. Uh, the TEE provides better imaging of the left atrial appendage, which is where these clots tend to come from. Uh, as you know, blood, when it sits still, wants to clot. When the left atrial appendage gets baggy or saggy or dilated or the patient's in atrial fibrillation and not clearing blood out of that chamber effectively, when the blood sits still, it tends to clot. And then later, with arrhythmias or, or blood pressure changes, sometimes those clots will break loose, travel up to the brain, and cause the stroke. So the TE is most useful, especially in younger patients or folks where we clearly have a cardioembolic source of this, uh, or when the 2D image is just too poor to get good quality. Uh, the TEs we don't do all the time because of the mort mortality and morbidity potentially associated with them. It's, it's about one in 800 or so can have trouble with the esophagus as far as putting in the probe and that kind of thing. But in general, TEE gives you much better windows of the heart. Um, there's a lot of controversy over the years septal defects, patent form and oval, uh, seem to be, you know, the combination of both does increase the risk of stroke. There's still controversy about either one independently, but the, the treatment for cardiac thrombus is anticoagulation, and in isolated PFOs without an atrial septal defect or a baggy atrium, so far the trials have said no, no clear benefit to PFO closure. Um, but again, if there's clot, then they need to be anticoagulated. If it's just an isolated PFO without clot or without stroke, then generally we don't treat those. Cardiac monitoring, we're looking for AFib. I mean, this is the main arrhythmia, which as I just sort of explained how it does that, can, can increase the risk of emboli, thrombi forming in the heart and breaking loose. Maybe intermittent and very difficult to catch, um, which is a common thing. So every stroke patient should be on telemetry from the time they arrive in the ED till the time they're in acute rehab. Um, we're starting to do more and more outpatient implantable monitoring. Um, now we've got some much improved devices. Implantable monitors are very easy to put in by cardiologists, and we can monitor the patient long term without the, the big hassles of Holter monitoring and the difficulty for the patient in keeping the equipment together. Um, implantable monitors are really good for folks where we don't know why they had their stroke, and especially if it's clearly an embolic stroke where they've showered emboli, but Sometimes you look at the TEE, everything's clean, they're in normal sinus rhythm the whole time in the hospital. These are the folks, it's a good idea to do some longer term monitoring to look for AFib, because if you can anticoagulate those patients, you're gonna enormously reduce their risk of stroke. The treatment, again, is anticoagulation. We've got a number of different agents now, but, but the treatment remains that. These are, now the new devices are called implantable loop recorders, and in a study they detected paroxysmal AFib in 25% of patients who'd already had a negative stroke workup and uh, 24 hours of tele in the hospital. So they're picking up a significant number of patients. This was a median monitoring time of 48 days, and it's relatively simple to insert or remove. So this is another thing that has changed and simplified long-term stroke sort of risk reduction and management. Medications for stroke, there's a large number of, of things we use, but in some ways things have not changed much over the years. Aspirin is still the mainstay, about a 10% risk reduction. Aspirin combined with extended release dipyramidol, uh, approximately 20 to 30% risk reduction. Clopetagrel, non-inferior to aspirin with extended release dipyramidol. This was interesting, the folks who make the aspirin with extended release dipyramidol, um, funded this study, and we're, I think, hoping to show superiority to make themselves the go-to agent, but the uh, study failed to show that. So actually, even though the independent studies of the two drugs showed an advantage to the aspirin with extended release dipyramidol, clopetagrel did pretty good, was non-inferior in the head-to-head -head trial. So depending on the patient, we use both agents. Um, the, the aspirin with extended release dipyramidol tends to cause headache. It's a twice-a-day drug, and right now it tends to be more expensive. Uh, but clopetagrel has some issues of interaction with the proton pump inhibitors, uh, particularly omeprazole, which is over-the-counter now. Uh, there's also some genetic issues. Some folks do not have risk reduction with this agent. And so that's the downside, although it's once a day in generic, so it's still very popular among patients and physicians. Um, 
uh, it's just been a problem with omeprazole because a lot of folks are on it as an outpatient. We have no idea because they're just buying it at Costco or whatever. No benefit to combining aspirin with clopidogrel in stroke. And this is an interesting thing because in, in cardiac disease, there is a benefit. The heart is a muscle. It's a tough muscle. It doesn't bleed too easily. The brain bleeds very easily. And this is what we saw in the studies is that when you combine aspirin with clopidogrel for brain disease, you increase the risk of bleeding, but you do not decrease the overall risk of stroke. So interestingly, we do add, I tend to add an 81 milligram aspirin to the product with aspirin and extended release dipermidol, because actually it doesn't perhaps have quite enough aspirin in it. But for the folks with Clopetagrel, we don't need them on aspirin from a stroke standpoint. Now, from a cardiac standpoint, you've got to weigh the pluses and minuses. And, and, and you know, if the heart doesn't work, the brain is not going to do well. And so certainly for patients that benefit from having aspirin combined with Clopetagrel for cardiac reasons, we will leave them on that unless they've had a bleed as far as strokes go. And then AFib, the treatment remains, you know, anticoagulation. Blood pressure reduction, ACE inhibitors have turned out to be very interesting drugs. A lot of the drugs we use in stroke may work differently than in some ways we think. Uh, because with ACE inhibitors, they seem to reduce stroke risk even in patients with normal blood pressure. Same thing with statins. We may not know all the mechanism of action of statins because even folks with normal cholesterol will benefit, have a stroke risk reduction if they're on a statin. Uh, multiple studies have shown they reduce the risk of stroke in those with coronary disease and elevated or total or low density LDL cholesterol. Uh, the heart protection study showed that simvastatin reduced the risk of stroke by about 25% uh, in folks with coronary disease. In the subgroup with prior strokes, uh, the major risk of vascular events was reduced by 21%. And the benefits persisted in those with an LDL of less than 116 or total cholesterol less than 193. Uh, consider adding CoQ10, about 200 milligrams a day to patients on statins. One of the issues that, again, I'm in an interesting position with, I'm the guy that sees the folks with the side effects of the statins because they come to neurologists for particularly peripheral neuropathy, muscle pain, thigh pain, myopathy, sometimes memory loss and fatigue. All of these are potential side effects of the statin medications. But on the other hand, they reduce your risk of stroke and heart attack and keep people alive. So they're beneficial medicines. But it looks like that the statin medications deplete CoQ10. And this may be a factor, particularly in the, the muscle issues patients have and perhaps in the neuropathy as well. Common preventable risk factors for stroke. Prevention is the name of the game. The more strokes we can prevent, I, I'm, I'm all for it. The less we have to get up in the middle of the night and run around in circles and do stuff. So it's much better to keep the patients happy and healthy at home rather than waiting for them to have a stroke and then begin to address their risk factors. So high blood pressure, smoking tobacco, air pollution. Actually, you know, the studies of air pollution are very disturbing. Air pollution is a much bigger risk factor for all-cause mortality, respiratory disease, coronary artery disease, dementia, stroke. Um, but because it's a hard thing to do much about, and particularly for individual physicians, it doesn't get a lot of press. But actually, uh, it's a significant risk factor. And of course, smoking tobacco. I, I, uh, I did some undergraduate work and uh, medical sociology training at the University of Kentucky, which has an enormous amount of money from tobacco companies. And I was fascinated that when I was there, they were still doing studies trying to prove that smoking is not bad for you. Uh, it, it was fascinating. A lot of money going through that university. And you know, I, I remember when I was there, they had a study where 2,000 beagles were smoking 20 packs of cigarettes a day. It was the weirdest thing. Uh, they had little masks on them, kind of like, you know, rebreather masks, and they were pumping them full of cigarettes trying to show something. But anyway, smoking's still bad for you regardless of what uh, those studies may show. Uh, obesity, an epidemic in the United States, terrible problem, both due to the sedentary lifestyle and also just the, the weight and the blood sugar issues. Diabetes, high cholesterol, heart disease, sitting around too much. Lack of fresh fruits and vegetables is another huge one. More and more studies are pointing this out. And depression and anxiety. Uh, anxiety is a big risk factor stroke, and even depression without anxiety raises the risk of stroke. We need more happy, relaxed, exercising people who eat right. <laughs> or, or, you know, I need to do that more myself. Uh, red meat and stroke. There's been a couple of really interesting... I, I'm a vegetarian, so I'm biased about this. But, but it is interesting. There's been some powerful studies showing that uh, this one study was done in women, that women who consume at least 102 grams a day of red meat had a 42% higher risk of stroke than women who consume 25 grams or less. It's a pretty strong study. Uh, it's a consumption of red meat is a risk factor for hypertension, and this hemo iron is a, is a 
toxic pro-oxidant. We talk a lot about antioxidants, but pro-oxidants are, are very bad. They increase the risk of uh, sort of destabilization of plaques, inflammation of blood vessel walls, and increase the risk of stroke. And uh, substituting one serving of red meat with a serving of nuts or fish reduced stroke risk by 17%, and replacing it with poultry reduced the risk by 27%. So this was kind of a surprising study, even for vegetarians. We thought, wow, this is bigger than we thought. And then rehab, this is one of the other neglected things about stroke care. Once we're done with our acute stroke workup, the most important thing is to get that patient to rehab. Once they're medically stable, the quicker they get walking and working with therapy, the better they're gonna do long term. And so one of the big benefits we have at Santa Rosa Memorial is an acute rehab center right on site. I work closely with all those folks. They do a fantastic job. Um, Basically, everybody needs a swallow screen in the ED when they arrive. Everybody gets inpatient speech, physical therapy, and occupational therapy. Everybody gets a rehab evaluation, physical medicine consultation, and then we decide what do they need next. Inpatient rehab, subacute rehab, extended care facility, or some folks, lucky enough, go home with PTOT, and that's all they need. Uh, so this is kind of the, the big overview of stroke care. Now I'd like to bring you Dr. Joey English, who will talk to us about large vessel occlusions and acute mechanical thrombectomy, which has been a game changer in stroke care. I'm the opening act, he's the rock star, all right? Okay.